Both India and Ukraine suffered from artificial famines imposed on them by British and Russian colonial authorities, respectively. In both cases, colonialists who committed mass crimes against the indigenous populations were considered heroes in their imperial metropoles. Yet there were also differences in the way the relations between the colonial master and the colonized were organized. It is time to analyze both the similarities and differences of these cases and to map a more comprehensive picture of the imperialisms and colonialisms of the past and present. You're listening to Ukraine World Podcast and its series Thinking in Dark Times. My name is Volodymyr Yermolonko. I'm a Ukrainian philosopher, chief editor of Ukraine World and president of Pan Ukraine. In this episode, I invite you to listen to a conversation learning more about each other, Indian authors in Ukraine, which took place in Kyiv at Pan Ukraine headquarters on April 17, 2024. We had two guests, Tenaz Dastur, human rights activist and the UNICEF ex-global coordinator for landmines and focal point for child sh- soldiers, and Bishan Samadar, director at Seagull Books, an Indian publishing house specializing in translating world literature. Before we start, let me remind you that Ukraine World is brought to you by Internet Ukraine, one of the largest Ukrainian media NGOs. You can support our work at patreon.com slash Ukraine World. You can find these links in the description of this episode. This episode is produced with support from the Ukrainian Institute. Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, we will start our conversation. It's a, a special day for us because uh, we have a uh, very interesting guest from India. And it's not every day that we have guests from India uh, in Ukraine. So we are very happy to, to meet you here. This is our conversations, joint conversations from Pan Ukraine and Ukraine World. Uh, my name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm president of Pan Ukraine and chief editor of Ukraine World. If you don't, um, uh, if you don't yet know, so uh, this is uh, the regular conversation we are making within the program Solidarity with Ukraine. It's uh, supported by International Renaissance Foundation. This is just a footnote to understand where we are. Uh, our conversation will be in English, and I hope you will also be able to re-listen to it on our uh, Ukraine World podcasts. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, first Dr. Tenas Dastur, uh, who is a, um, uh, a person specializing in uh, political economy, but also working for many years at UNICEF and particularly UNICEF uh, is a UN uh, agency, and particularly uh, TENAS has been working on issues of women and children in armed conflict. And actually she knows quite a bit about it and uh, quite a few regions, so I hope we will talk about this as well. And uh, uh, Bishan Samadar, who is uh, an editor and director of Seagull Books, one of the most respected international publishers of literary translations. So you can see that our guests uh, are from different fields, but uh, this makes, uh, I hope, our conversation even more interesting. What we wanted um, to make this conversation about is, um, you know, it's it's not very much that Ukrainians know about India. It's not so much that probably Indians know about Ukraine. And um, it's very important that we find those topics that unite us, that points that connect us. And, uh, of course, visiting Ukraine is one of those experiences, practical experiences, which, which helps you, I, th- I hope, to understand Ukraine better. Uh, and the the I think the goal of our conversation is just to make this make these meeting points where where we are similar, where we are different. How can we support each other? How can we understand each other? Because on the one hand, there is probably little that unites us, except for the fact that we are human beings and we are we are speaking rationally in in English language right now. But at the same time, there is a lot of history of uh, of imperialism and colonialism, and uh, and fight for independence, and fight for sovereignty, and fight for democracy, um, that I hope we will talk about. So let me first ask a very simple question: uh, You are here 
And it's, again, it's not that obvious that uh, a person from India will decide to go to Ukraine far away. What is your motivation? Why you are here? Bishan, let's start with you. Thank you. Um, before I start, I'll just a uh, very quick thank you to Penny Crane uh, for uh, bringing us uh, here, uh, both Atenas and me. Uh, this is uh, really a sterling opportunity for us to learn about this country, about uh, the wonderful people, and about uh, the great courage and bravery that you have been showing uh, to the whole world for the last two years at least. Uh, I'll. Uh, before I come to how I ended up here, I just want to share something uh, with you all. Uh, on 24th of uh, February 2022, um, we were all uh, in India following the news very closely. And uh, I remember I walked into the office and my colleague who sits next to me said like, uh, it looks like it's begun. And I said, yes, I got the notification from BBC and uh, uh, so we went through the day, and uh, we went. Uh, we were looking at the news all the time, uh, worried. We had uh, uh, no idea where it would lead, how big the conflict would be, who would be involved, who would be affected. Uh, the next uh, morning, I think it was a Friday, I could not get out of bed. I think. Now, what I had was a nervous breakdown, and I had to call my boss to say that I'm feeling terrible, I cannot come to work. At that time, I could not understand why I was feeling that way. Uh, in our country, uh, we have had wars, but they were perhaps minor and very far away from where I live, in my lifetime at least. Uh, and. As a person who has grown up valuing freedom, it was something, uh, the attack, the invasion here, somehow meant something to me. I was uh, very depressed. I went uh, to a therapist and I explained what had happened. My therapist was very surprised. She said, you know, I have many clients, they all come to me uh, saying uh, what horrible things have happened to them for which they're feeling bad. It is very unusual that you're coming to me feeling really bad about something that has happened to somebody else. And she said, I think it's a good thing. Uh, then I realized that uh, I do not have the power to stop Putin from bombing. I do not have the power to stop uh, Hamas from terrorism or uh, Afghanistan or Taliban from uh, you know, torturing people. Uh, I come from a place of great humility. All I have perhaps is uh, empathy and compassion. And uh, that is also part of my work because I come from the world of literature uh, where and literature works through empathy and compassion. I try to bring forth stories told by real people about perhaps imagined individuals, but there is always reality in them. And uh, that is the way uh, I see my role in uh, this entire business of uh, understanding each other, of uh, understanding uh, our difficulties, but also understanding our joys, even in the midst of our difficulties. So when uh, the invitation came from Penn Ukraine to represent our culture, our country, and visit Ukraine, uh, in, it, it, it actually came to my boss, because uh, um, uh, a person of Ukrainian origin uh, knows my boss well, but uh, he asked me that if uh, I would like to go, and even actually before he asked me, uh, I said like, uh, will you uh, give me leave to go? Because uh, this is very important to me, this is actually personal to me. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a bit short notice, and uh, 
we <laughs> i mean i tried everything possible to get visas in time and stuff like that it was very stressful till the last minute i did not know if i would be boarding the plane but uh uh, thanks to everybody in Penn Ukraine and their tremendous support, especially Maxim, <laughs> whom I probably called up in the middle of the night saying all this, uh, that I am actually really glad to be here. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I, I think this is uh, one step, uh, maybe the first step that I am taking in order to be able to uh, do something about uh, understanding each other. Thank you, Bijan. I agree with your therapist that uh, that if you have the empathy towards somebody else, it's a, it's actually good. But at the same time, uh, what we are Ukrainians are struggling, and maybe many other nations who are in trouble is, of course, it's it's difficult to have this empathy from other people, and it's normal that people are, you know, in many ways indifferent. So. For us, coming abroad to tell the Ukrainian story, usually we come to Europe, of course, uh, but not always. And um, I mean, the, the biggest, the biggest psychological barrier is, of course, that actually people hear your story and um, maybe they listen to you attentively, but you understand that this is not their story. So and uh, and it's probably normal. And but if it's it's normal but traumatizing, right? When you when you tell a story about your pain, your suffering, the, the suffering of your uh, friends and neighbors and, and uh, friends that had been killed and family members that uh, have been killed. It's, uh, but at the same time, yeah, you should, okay, yeah, I, I can compassion with you. And then the conversation goes to, to another topic. This is, of course, very traumatizing. Uh, this is why we so like value people like you who have this capacity to feel this empathy across thousands and miles so so thank you again for for coming and tell us maybe i will pass the same question to you why are you here why are you, have you decided to come because frankly speaking lots of our international colleagues whom we invite they are afraid of coming and uh, and we understand why uh, Today we had another tragic event and uh, shelling of, of Chernihiv uh, and when I was going here I was, uh, I was uh, saying that 15 people have died probably, the toll is already higher and this news you know comes very, very as a routine for us already but why, why you, you have this courage and empathy to come? Okay, so first, uh, again, let me thank uh, Penn Ukraine um, and um, Penn World um, for inviting us. It's um, really quite an honor to be here. I would like to thank Maxim, Anna, and of course, Tatiana um, for all their support. Um, okay, so quite unlike uh, Bishan, I have been to many, many war areas. That was my job. So I was there in Afghanistan when the Taliban, in Jalalabad, which is the Taliban headquarters, when they were setting up all their crazy rules and regulations. And I've been in Angola, which was under terrible civil war for 30 years. I was in um, former Yugoslavia. I was in Chechnya. Uh, for two years, I lived in Russia. So I understand Russians very, very well. And um, about half my life I spent in the United States because I got educated there and I used to work in, the, in UNICEF over there. So having done that, of course, um, uh, you know, when the war broke out, I understood that this is not going to be something small. This is going to be a long, protracted war. Believe me, if you think this is going to be over now, it's not. I'm so sorry to tell you this. Um, I have been, you know, to Chechnya, but of course we had to go on armored personnel carriers with lots of bodyguards because the buildings that we saw today are just a small, tiny little fraction of what was destroyed in Chechnya. It was horrible over there. Anyway, and um, so having lived in Russia and having worked over there in the IDP camps, um, understanding you know, what they would allow, and even though it's the United Nations, what they would allow and wouldn't allow, um, they, Chechens are Russians. 
And if they can do it to their own people, what do they care about Ukraine? You have to understand this. Oh, believe me, I understand it very, ma very well. So, um, and this war was going on for years and years. And I was living next to the Russian military barracks. And every evening, not every evening, but a lot of the evenings when we came out on the balcony, we could see in the evening them shooting the rockets from the military barracks, which are very close to our place, straight into Chechnya, you know? And it was quite terrible, you know, for us every day to live through it. And then the che Chechen IDPs would come down to another republic in Ingushetia, where we basically were in charge of the camps. We were in charge of the tents. We were in charge of, uh, I mean, I say we, I mean UN, because that's UNHCR, it's a different agency. I'm a women and children agency. So we were in charge of the education, about the immunization, um, the water, the sanitation, the health, all that for the uh, Chechens who had come down. All right, so just moving on. The reason why I came here actually was to really see for myself the situation and um, to understand from the people um, what it is that they're facing. Now, you can be in Kyiv and get a sense, a false sense of security that everything is okay. But in the two days that we were here with the air raid sirens going on, we could understand that nothing really is okay. Because, um, you know, at any time we saw today, right, with the missile strikes. So it's something that, you know, can happen to anyone at any time. One needs to be basically on one's guard, right? Then I was reading through all the UNICEF reports on what is happening to children in Ukraine, because that's my area of interest. What is happening to their mothers? How are they feeling? And if you go on the site, you'll understand that the children are feeling very, very um, hopeless. And when you don't have a sense of vision of what is going to happen, you know, if you don't have a sense of um, your future, your future being something that is good, something that is bright, um, then it's very, very sad. It's very traumatic for the child. So I really believe that a lot of children here need psychosocial trauma counseling. I don't know if that is happening. I have no idea, but I really believe that that is something that needs to be done. Now, one doesn't need, you know, big term psychologists only, because you have art therapy, you have dance therapy, you have movement therapy, there are many different kinds of things. But definitely the children need an outlet for this to express their sorrow, their happiness, what they see for themselves, uh, what they see around them, you know, in everyday life. So, um, well, in a nutshell, the reason why I came here is to actually speak to people and to understand what it is particularly going on, mentally, physically, how they actually feel about this war, and, um, you know, what it is that they hope in the end, you know, how do they, they hope that this would go through? You know, there has to be an end. There always has to be an end. So, you know, what do they, what do they uh, want from the government? What, do they, what are their dreams? What are their aspirations, right? Um, so there are many people among you, I'm sure, you know, just go about your ordinary jobs every day. But among you, there will be people who will be leaders in the future. Among you, there will be people who will be authors and writers. And among you, there will be people who will eventually have a vision for Ukraine, which may be very, very different from what it is now. Because under stressful war situations, one really cannot think with that wider scope of vision. But once there is peace, I'm sure you will have a great future, you know. And, um, you know, Ukraine has been, um, in the context of looking at, you know, your, your neighbors, it's true you were the breadbasket of Europe, you know. Everybody knows that the massive amounts of food that this country has produced uh, is, is very commendable. Now, of course, um, we went to the Holodomir um, monument, and there were three successive times when there was um, genocide. Um, we in Bengal, of course we, we weren't born then, what the British did in Bengal, which was also a bread basket, you know, it was a rice bowl actually of India, they just took all our grain and said, okay, Churchill did this, we're gonna give this grain to the front line, 
to the British forces fighting. And the Australian ship was standing in the port and exactly. was not uh, allowed. allowed to give the grain to the local yes. people. And so if you go to, uh, I'm sure he's been, in New Delhi, there's this uh, museum, Jantar Mantar Museum, and um, you'll see these actual films of people starving, dying on the streets. We had all the food, it's just that the British took it. So, you know, I can very well relate to what happened over here with the grain and all being taken away, the collectivization, the Bolsheviks coming and ruining everything. And the people over here, you know, starving because this was done also um, to us. That's very interesting. And I want to come back to, to this question because it's, it's really important that we can find these parallels between different colonial powers. But let me ask Tenas you about, you, you say that you know Russians very well. And for, for Ukrainians, of course, uh, well, what we see in this war, and we also relate to previous wars, uh, to the Second World War, to the Chechen War, is, is this level of cruelty, the, the un incredible level of cruelty. Have you seen such level of cruelty like in, in, in other regions that you visited? How do you explain this level of cruelty of Russian army? Yes, actually, there's great cruelty in Afghanistan. Horrible, horrible. In Bosnia, was you cannot even believe. I had um, the UN interpreter with me, and somebody was doing a survey with the women. And um, I'm sorry, this is really going to shock you, but um, you know, we were talking to the women, and you know, they were having. They were really traumatized. And this lady, these ladies were talking about their young daughters first being raped by the Serbs, and then the Serbs forced their fathers to rape the daughters. So this is cruelty like in every place. It's really, really horrible, if you can imagine it. So, you know. This is the kind of thing that we would report. You know, we had to record what was going on over there, and it's it's terrible. And yes, of course, it was very very cruel what was going on in 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 Chechnya, because of horrible accounts. You know, the Chechens would come down, and we'd be talking to them, and you know, they were all traumatized. We had our counselors talking to them, talking to the children. Uh, my job was, um, you know, I was specialist in landmines, okay, and children affected by landmines and unexploded ordnance. So was to provide the prosthetic devices for the children, and. Um, you know, even hearing what the children had to say, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. So yes, it's cruelty beyond measure. So I, I think one of the explanation is that um, the people, I mean, if we take Russia, if we take probably Serbia at the time, if we take some other uh, other, other other nations that, that commit this cruelty, that uh, they have this climate of cruelty incredible in their own societies, and they are subject to cruelty, like in their daily life when they were kids, from their fathers, the mothers, and then they're kind of accustomed to it. And uh, this is how I try to understand w what is in the minds of the Russian soldiers and wha why they're doing that, because uh, it, it's not enough to explain this war with geopolitics or with politics. You, you need to think in terms of psychology. You need to think in terms of you know, such questions as the culture of violence, etc. cetera. Let, let me just come to this question that uh, Tenas already started and maybe start with Bishan, because it's, it's very, very interesting. Because I, I was like, when, when I was preparing for this talk, I, I know very little about India, and but I, I've read some books, I've listened to some podcasts, and I have seen, uh, you know, these striking parallels. Like uh, Tenaz already mentioned this this question of famine, and the punishment by hunger. You not only you know impose hunger on on people, you impose hunger on people who consider agriculture as their essence, as their kind of nature, as their destination. And it was about Stalinist and not only Stalinist famine in Ukraine. Then, of course, all this, you know, um, all, uh, um, all this, um, you know, for example, take the, the wars, the First World War and the Second World War. How many Indians were serving the British uh, army in the First World War? 
and and even I think it was one and a half million, and uh, Second World War even more, like two million and and more, and how this actually led to a certain national movement because why should we die for another power? Uh, and interestingly, this self-consciousness of Indians after the First World War and of Ukrainians after the First World War, they were coming together because they were related to this fact that, yeah, people were serving in the imperial armies. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, all this, you know, reframing, reforging, like we, we have to reforge people. But there are certain differences, and it is important to know these differences. Uh, and I think that these differences have not been like well described, because we look at the imperialism and colonialism mostly from the Marxist or post-Marxist point of view. Like the British colonials was coming uh, through the company, through the East Indian Company, so through the private, ca through the capitalism. While here in Ukraine it was coming, well, if you take the Soviet rule, through absolutely different means, like party and quasi-state organizations. And that lacks, gives us not so many instruments to think about this colonialism here in a, in a usual like leftist anti-imperialist uh, thought. And another thing is that wh what I'm telling always is that like maritime empires, uh, their attitude to the colonized is like you are different, you will never become like us. And the, the attitude of racism and segregation, etc. While the Russian empire towards the Ukrainians is that like you will never be different than us. You should be you should be the same as us. So the logic of assimilation is much more important than the logic of segregation. Uh, how do you reflect on, on this, on similarities and differences? Uh, yes, actually, uh, what you just mentioned, the last thing that you just mentioned, is something, uh, to be honest, I had uh, not thought about before I came to Ukraine. That has been a very important learning for me, uh, this, uh, this, this bit of history and uh, how we are looking at history, this, uh, uh, this inclusive uh, sort of genocide where your identity is uh, uh, erased by saying that, but you are us. <laughs> so, you know, but uh, n at the same time, never forgetting when, when, when a Russian says that you're like us, which means that I am definitely better and I will make you better by making making you part of us. Uh, of course, that was completely different uh, with uh, uh, colonial uh, 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 conquest of uh, uh, India and many other parts of the world, obviously, uh, because it was a question of uh, different races, which were, who were uh, the societies were strikingly different. Uh, and uh, it was uh, easy in a sense, it was easy for uh, European powers, like especially the British, to uh, take advantage of tremendous social divisions that existed within the Indian society. Uh, divisions of caste, divisions of class, divisions of uh, regionality, and you know a lot of um, strife within different regions. Uh, and of course, some uh, uh, striking uh, differences in uh, religious practice. And these were utilized to a great extent, uh, which is why the British would never want uh, uh, the Indians to become like them. No, that was not the point. Uh, British knew that this culture, this society uh, thrives on difference. <laughs> it, it, it thrives on divisions. So let us further uh, create divisions and that division was very clear that you know we are white supremacists and uh, we bring knowledge we bring you know prosperity uh, and uh, we are going to lift you out of you know your misery but uh, you will never be us of course that is what uh, that is what the narrative was uh, the idea was to exploit as much as possible, and over 200 years, trillions and trillions of dollars worth of um, money was taken away. Our industries were killed completely. We were forced to become an agricultural uh, 
country. We were not an agricultural country before uh, the British came. We had lots of industries, but those industries were killed. The Industrial Revolution that propelled Europe in the 1900s was not allowed to happen in India and in all other uh, colonies. Uh, we were very systematically and very cleverly, I must confess, uh, made poor. Uh, so that, that I, I think that is a very striking difference. Uh, and when I learned about uh, this attitude of the Russian uh, uh, colonization of uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, land and culture and identity, and I'm sure they must be doing it in other places around uh, the region, perhaps. I don't know the history of those countries or those cultures very well. Um, but I, I found that very striking. Uh, but that is also uh, that is also communism. This uh, uh, this obsession with sameness. Uh, that uh, yeah, we are just the same. And uh, sorry, I'm carrying on. But I'll I'll make a very short point, and this uh, Tenas would also know very well. Uh, see, we come from a state within India that had democratic rule by the Communist Party of India for 35 years. So we have some idea of what it is to live under socialism. They were democratically elected, government, uh, government after government, but they were all communists. And their attitude, even during the rule uh, that they had, the democratic rule that they had in our state, was to basically ignore differences that, you know, uh, oh, religious differences, they don't exist. We will not address it. Caste differences, they don't exist. We will not address it. You know, uh, this obsession with sameness, but our society is different. You know, it is, it, I'm not saying that, it, that there should be divisions and there should be, you know, like uh, hierarchies, but uh, that is a reality. That's a very strong lived reality. It is unfortunate, but it has to be addressed so that one can come out of it, not ignore it. So that is a little parallel uh, between, you know, communist rule, Soviet rule, uh, perhaps here, as well as in uh, our country. So there are all kinds of uh, little that, things. That's very, in and yeah, that's very interesting because it's like attitudes to, towards ideologies. You cannot say that, you know, socialism is good and capitalism is bad, or capitalism is good and socialism is bad. It's always the question of proportion, like, because it's always the question how you combine values, how you try to harmonize different values. Yes, absolutely. L let me ask Bishan, uh, like the follow-up question, also about culture, and uh, uh, Tenas already mentioned it a little bit while mentioning Churchill, and that's very interesting <coughs> and important, because when you look at like British imperial history and how people who oppressed Indians and made like huge crimes, I don't remember this this episode uh, when uh, the I think the, the the big number of six uh, yes. were in, in the 1919 park. in Jallianwala Bagh in um, in uh, in Amritsar, uh, which is in the Punjab state. Uh, uh, yeah, and were actually massacred, and the general yes. who did this actually got the you know award, and I think even even Kipling was like donating money for him, etc. So. For for Britain, and you understand when you are in in central central London, how it is still imperial power, how it's still valued, and uh, and even even in the urban space, but people who are heroes for one nation are actually criminals for another nation, and people who are you know take like people like Kipling, right? For you, it's probably uh, a, a problematic imperial writer. You mentioned Churchill. Of course, Churchill is like considered as a hero and, uh, and fighter against Hitler. And of course, he, he got all the rewards for that. But for you, for uh, you mentioned this episode and, and there are some other episodes how he was neglecting, like mentioning um uh, uh mentioning uh, gandhi coming coming to london and how he was like saying that this is a fakir or something you know so looking at it 
you probably understand better how Ukrainians struggle with, you know, downing Lenin statues, uh, thinking critically about like classics of Russian literature because there is lots of this imperialism in Russian literature, like Pushkin and others. What is how to explain it to, to those who say, okay, this is just culture, don't don't do anything about how how to explain to that you know every historical he figure has pros and contras, and sometimes a person whom you consider to be you know saint and hero for other nation for other people it's it's a it's a author of mass crimes. Uh, well, yes, that is uh, very difficult because uh, all these uh, figures uh, who are heroes or uh, somebody's heroes or somebody's terrorist. Um, uh, Unfortunately, they all have such propaganda, such propagandist narratives around them that uh, uh, they're not seen as complex, flawed characters. They're made to see as, uh, yeah, they're made to be seen as uh, uh, great people or completely evil people. Um, speaking of Churchill, uh, the same story uh, from during the famine of 1943. Uh, so this was at the height of the Second World War, and uh, of course grains were needed to feed uh, soldiers who were fighting uh, in the uh, Asian uh, theater of the war. Uh, and uh, millions of people, like millions of people, were dying uh, on the streets of Calcutta. And I have heard this from my grandfather, who was at that time posted in Calcutta. Uh, he was working for the governor of uh, the British governor of uh, Bengal. And uh, when uh, the governor of Bengal, the British governor of Bengal said like, uh, wrote to Churchill saying like, sir, I mean, the situation is extremely bad. People, thousands of people are dying. We need to do something because otherwise people will rise up against us. You know, it's going to be really bad. Church's response was, so many people are dying. Why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So that was the famous. So, you know, that kind of, but uh, in, we, uh, India fought for independence. But let us not forget that the regime that in India that came after independence from British colonialism was extremely pro-British colonialism. There is nothing, I mean, it is, uh, there was, the, the government was run by people who were educated by the British. They spoke the same language. They had, they espoused the same values of democracy, of uh, whatever, liberty, equality, <laughs> fraternity, that kind of thing. Uh, all we did not have was, okay, we did not have a king or a queen, uh, but uh, uh, the laws were very similar to what, was, what had been drafted by the British. Uh, one person tried to change things substantially. Uh, his name was B.R. Ambedkar, uh, but he was a lone person, and after a while he almost gave up, and unfortunately he died soon after. Uh, so there was a continuation of uh, uh, the colonial mindset, uh, and uh, the British, the major British figures were never vilified to that extent because uh, Nehru, who uh, became prime minister and remained prime minister for a decade and a half after that, uh, did not want any kind of animosity. They, uh, he wanted uh, all the countries to be uh, friends because he was like, you never know whom you need when, <laughs> because uh, India is a big nation and there were lots of needs, which is why, uh, you know, we became very close to Russia, Soviet Russia, uh, which is a whole history altogether and uh, we can talk about it or we can uh, skip that as well. So, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, we, which is why uh, this uh, way of uh, looking at uh, our uh, colonial oppressors uh, specific colonial oppressors as actually complex people uh, hasn't really happened, I think. But uh, maybe in the mainstream, 
But that is the great thing about uh, literature, and we have a lot of it in India. Uh, a lot has been written about the colonial period, about individuals, about uh, British colonizers who did a lot of good, uh, about British colonizers who did a lot of bad things, and uh, uh, that is one great thing about literature, and I keep coming back to it because that's my world, uh, where these complexities can be explored. And I think we need to read more, uh, or even watch films more, or uh, uh, utilize uh, what culture has to give. Tenas, let me ask a question about you know your field, the children and women, and primarily children. You, I'm sure you, that you know that the Russians have a very specific practice about children, the Ukrainian children. So, so they basically want to take them, uh, and uh, according to Ukrainian data, it's like several dozens of thousands of children kidnapped and you know taken to Russia. According to Russian data, it's much more. It's like hundreds of thousands. Why do they do that? And how you also relate in your work? Is it is it is it a sign of genocide? Is it a sign of you know forceful deportation? Is it a sign of demography as a part of the war of the 21st century? How do you see it? Okay, so um, when I my work was in the Caucasus, right, Northern Caucasus, and um, I was in um, North Ossetia, which is a Christian republic, but my work was in Ingushetia, which is a Muslim republic, working for Chechens, which is a Muslim republic, and other work was in Dagestan, which is another Muslim republic. Now, um, I believe after the Second World War, entire populations, Muslim populations, were lifted from these areas and taken to Russia's far east. They have, uh, because they didn't want... Um, consecutive areas to have what they felt were, you know, trouble areas because they weren't Russian, white Russian Slavs, right? Because they're Caucasus. Caucasian people are different. Far East people are very different in Russia. They're not all white Russians. Hmm. So they wanted to make sure that there would be no problems or issues. Uh, so Russia lifted a lot of children in Afghanistan. Now, I believe that they lift the children, take them to Russia, put them in with Russian families so that those children have little, they hope, or no empathy, no, um, they forget. They want them to forget about their life in Afghanistan, and which is a Muslim country. Now you're going to a Christian, you're going to be adopt adopted. So over here, maybe the religion is not such a big thing, but your, your past, your culture, your language, your ethnography, your family, your values will all be changed once the children are lifted and put over there in Russia. And who knows when they'll be brought back. Maybe you have a tracing system where you, um, we had this in Rwanda, which is you trace the children which have um, uh, lost their parents or they've been left, you know, and other people have adopted them. So if you have that, if you don't have it, you should have it in Ukraine to know where these children have been lifted from whose families and, and taken because you want them back one day. You must have them back, right? But probably if it's a long time, if it's just a year or two or three, but if the child, I'm, I'm saying if they were maybe five or six, and then they come back as teenagers, they will have little or no memory of their parents. You know, They'll have little or no memory of what it is to be Ukrainian, which is very different from being Russian. So this is why they do it, because the next generation will not be like you, will not be over here, will not have that empathy, will not have that closeness, the bonds, the ties. You know, What makes you different from anybody else, right? You have a certain DNA, which is Ukrainian. And probably they hope to break that once and for all. And that's, I don't know if you, in your history, in Indian history, it's also present. It's using human bodies as, a, as, a, as an instrument of politics, mm -hmm. using the large, large number of human bodies. This is what probably, well, Foucault called it biopolitics. Maybe he didn't. 
mean I- exactly that, but it's really using human organisms and and moving them around. And totalitarian cultures, I mean, totalitarian societies do it. Russia has a huge territory, right? We all know about the deportation of Kirmli, like the whole nation was taken within a few hours, few days, taken literally from one place to another. Maybe I will ask the last question and then I will pass the floor to, to the audience. And my question is like, probably we had this conversation which is leading to this question. So the discussion um, uh, about Ukraine and Russian colonialism, etc., cetera, with, uh, with countries that have suffered from the Western colonialism are uh, quite difficult. Oh, why? Because it's always like we, we are seen uh, with the biggest suspicion, like in Latin America, in India, in Africa, like Americans are helping you, but Americans are huge imperialists, so you're just, uh, you know, puppets of imperialists. Or Brits are, help y- are helping you, but Brits are, you know, criminals that, I'm paraphrasing, of course, that did l- lots of crimes in, in Africa or India. Belgians are helping you, but look what Belgians did in, in Congo in late 19th century, and early 20th century. While Ukrainians are responding, no, 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 the real imperialists are Russians because they did the Holodomor, because they did deportations, because they did mass killings, and you don't know what you're talking about, let's study Russian imperialism, Let, let's fight for that. Well, I think that instead of like measuring who is worst empire, it's really better to, to think into these structural parallels and see how our experience and your experience we talked a, lot, a, a, a little bit about this, about famine, about sending you know millions of people to to the imperial wars. It's actually uh, th- there is so much similar, and I think this is the point uh, where we, we we need to talk about like forget this comparison who is the worst imperialist, but talk about us and, and about our parallels. What do you think? I think it's important. Before the Brits came to India, India was one of the largest economic powers. 34% of world GDP was from India. And of course, you know, look, one of the things you said uh, with the British is divide and rule. That is their policy. Divide and rule. Hindus here, Muslims here. Divide and rule. Okay? Then there were, we had over 500 princely states in India. So again, divide and rule. And I believe that, you know, in India, a lot of people didn't really see um, this as a colonial issue with Ukraine because this was a Soviet bloc. So we always saw it as one bloc, okay? These, uh, the Soviets have now basically are administering, you know, all these various, whether it was East Germany or Ukraine or Poland or Romania or Bulgaria, Right? It was in this particular block against the Western bloc. That's how we viewed it. We didn't really view it in the perspective of how did the Ukrainians feel or the Romanians or any of the other uh, countries, the nations. Yes. So, uh, yes, of course, historically it is the same thing. Uh, unfortunately for the British, uh, the prime minister now happens to be somebody of Indian origin sitting over there and governing them. I don't think they ever imagined that this situation would happen. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you can see this, this, uh, the same kind of line uh, which uh, the Russians are taking, right? And, of course, they have a huge propaganda machine. So, you know, a lot of people in India would talk a lot of nonsense and say, oh, because uh, President Putin had said that um, your president, I'm sorry to say this, is um, Nazi, and uh, people would say that. And I said, how can a Jewish person be Nazi? I mean, it's incredible. It's just and stupid. And s- supporting Muslim uh, terrorist yeah, acts. exactly. I mean, how can this be? How can anyone talk this nonsense and get away with it, you know? No rational human being can believe it. You know, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, this is the kind of, you know, Russian propaganda is going on every single day, right? And... Uh, I'm not even sure, because of course they, they uh, censor the news in Russia, right? So you can, uh, you can understand what they're feeding the people. But I don't believe that you know, everybody can be fooled. Certainly not the people that have come to Ukraine and have gone back injured or maimed or worse, you know, in body bags, dead. So um, 
that's that's absolutely not the case. And even in the US, I've read reports where there's lots of underreporting of Russian dead. So if they say that uh, if it's 50, no, it's maybe 250,000 of them which have died, right? They always underreport this and overreport the number of Ukrainians that you know have, have been killed. So today, while we were um, we went to a church and we saw this exhibition of um, what had happened, you know, Bucha. in Bucha, yes. And this uh, is Saint Andrew Church, Saint where Andrew's there was. Church, um, yeah. And we were walking through, and um, one of the the uh, Anna from Penn, Ukraine, happened to say that uh, the Russian propaganda is, oh, these are only actors lying on the ground, you know, they're not really dead, you know, it's it's this kind of thing, and uh, but I always say you can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, but you can never fool all the people all the time. So, I mean, this is a fact. Everybody's not an idiot. Everybody's not gonna buy into your nonsense. And I believe that, you know, whatever the route that was taken, you know, whether it's British or this, you, you know, you must believe that you will prevail, right? We prevailed over the British, and British were there for over 200 years. And you will prevail. It is may not be now, may not be in a few months, but you will. And you have to have that sense about you, you know. And maybe it was Gandhi and Nehru, or you know, all these Western educated people. But the fact of the matter is, they always had that sense that we are going to get our independence now. So many millions of Indians, over a few thousand British, I mean, it would have been a bloodbath in India. But that is why we call it the transfer of power. It's very gentle, right? It wasn't independence, it's transfer of power. Well, hopefully, Brits were so so tired about the Second World War that yeah. they were so weak and um, actually didn't have any money to continue. So, unfortunately, we don't have this situation now. But yes, yes. but we will prevail. I, I agree with you. I'm, totally. I am sure. I am sure that you will prevail. It is just you know a matter of time, right? And uh, maybe that is what the Russians are hoping that they wear you out. You know, they they it goes on every day, day in and day out, and that you get so tired one day that you say, okay, you know what? It's not worth it anymore. But I don't believe that that is it. You know, this, the spirit of of Ukraine or Ukrainians is very very. Um, it, it is something that you have risen, you've had so much of adversity through the last, which we weren't aware of, you know, in, let me tell you, really, we weren't aware of this. And if you prevail, then you will prevail. So I, I just wish that all of you understand this, that it's not going to be something that is quick. And the other thing I wanted to point out is um, ISIS, they attacked um, this uh, music concert in Moscow. And of course, the Russians spun it as Ukrainians attacked us. Well, I was just thinking about it. How foolish if Ukrainians are so powerful that they can come into the heart of Moscow and attack you. What is your security system saying, Mr. Putin? Right? That you are so weak and so foolish that you couldn't even stop an attack right in the heart of Moscow, which is like really heavily security over there. Okay? I'm not sure if you know, but nobody can travel from any part of Russia to Moscow. You can't just travel. You have to have a special permit. That is a system in Russia. You have to have a permit to go to the capital. So it's heavily guarded and protected. So um, of course, it's a very foolish thing that somebody could say when ISIS has said this. And I really believe that they did attack at that time. It's very premeditated uh, because they found that Russia is you know, now so bothered about Ukraine. There was divided, their society. Wagner people were there. They tried to take over. Now they have retreated. There's so much, you know, so many problems going on over there at the Kremlin. So this is the perfect time to, to show them that Guess what? We can still strike over here. Bishan, you wanted to add something? Or we pass to questions? No, I'll quickly add. Uh, I'll uh, second exactly what uh, she has said. I would also like to assure you that, uh, uh, I mean, from what I have uh, learned uh, from talking to uh, some of you here, uh, that there is uh, this sense that uh, in India there is uh, among uh, you know the general public there is no support for Ukraine. I, I assure you that is not the case. Uh, uh, we uh, 
um, m many of us, uh, it is, it is uh, India is a very large country. It has its own problems. So a lot of people are just... It's in the, the largest country in the world. I forgot to say at the beginning. Uh, so it has a, it's, it's, its own problems. So not everybody is focused on what is happening slightly far away. Uh, but many of us uh, who are aware of uh, terrible things that are happening everywhere. Uh, I mean, Russia is a force of the past. It is not a force of the future. We do not see it. Most of us do not see it like that. We do not look up to Putin. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of support, a lot of sympathy, empathy, compassion, for uh, and immense admiration for the tremendous resilience that you have shown, not just in the battlefield, but what we have now experienced right here in this room. And this I wouldn't have known unless I had come here, unless we had come here. And that for that, I thank all of you. So uh, yes, uh, we will see a uh, uh, free uh, day. We will see a uh, day without such violence. We will carry uh, what we have lost always in our hearts. But uh, just like the cherry blossoms uh, blooming everywhere that I saw today in amid the ruins, uh, we will all blossom again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tenas, and thank you, Bisham, for coming. And uh, really, it's a, it's a great joy for us, as I said uh, previously. <laughs> because we, why, why, we, why we like facilitate coming uh, people like you to, to Ukraine? Because presence uh, is a solution to many things like Presence is the first step to understanding. You will never understand something when you look at something from the screen. And thank you for your courage, because I understand that seeing from far away all Ukraine uh, looks like a, a big, big cemetery. But uh, you see that life is going on here. The cherry trees are blossoming, blossoming and, uh, and the food is delicious, and the drinks as well. And um, have a good time, and please pass the Ukrainian story to wherever you are. Thank you, thank you. This was a podcast by Ukraine World, a multilingual website about Ukraine. This was a conversation between me and Indian authors visiting Ukraine, the conversation that took place in Kyiv at Pan Ukraine headquarters on April 17th, 2024. My name is Volodymyr Yermolka, I'm Ukrainian philosopher and chief editor of Ukraine World. Uh, let me remind you that you can support our work at patreon.com slash Ukraine World. You can also support our volunteer trips to the front lines of this war at PayPal, ukraine.resisting.gmail.com. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine. Thank you.